Welcome back to World War II TV, folks. And if you remember our Torch series, we had a really incredible show where we talked about Casablanca in the middle of World War II. Well, another city of intrigue in the war was Lisbon. And talking about the fateful flight of a Yankee clipper to Lisbon in 1943 is today's guest, Brooke Blower, whose new book, <coughs> excuse me, got a frog in my throat, <coughs> is on that very subject. And you can find the links in the description below. So I'll bring Brooke in now. So good afternoon. How are you today, Brooke? Hi, how are you? Good to be here. Good to be here. And you know, when I was um, putting the, this show online and trying to work out what playlists to put it in, <laughs> I was struggling because it, yes. it was like, well, is it, is it part of that? Is it, is it spies? I suppose it kind of is. Is it this? Um, so it is an unusual subject. So before we get into your presentation, your PowerPoint, can you kind of tell us what, how you define yourself as, as a historian? What areas you're interested in and kind of what, why did you bring this subject to the world? Yeah, so when I start talking, I'll tell you all about why I got into this particular project. Um, but my background is not in military history. Um, I uh, began uh, studying sort of cultures uh, and political culture, both European history and American history in the first half of the 20th century. And my first book was about um, uh, politics in Paris and Americans in the 1920s and 30s. So I was really interested in World War I and in the interwar period, but World War II seemed kind of like a separate topic. And, and I, I will talk about, you know, how I came around to seeing this as uh, something I should be working on. But um, yeah, so I, I moved into this um, and I'm hopefully bringing to the subject a different set of methodological approaches and questions than you might get in military history to um, to supplement the the you know amazing work that's been done um, on the on World War II and military and, and diplomatic history as well high diplomatic history we have a lot of well, literature it about. all connects and, and you you, you sound very much to me like like my friend Michael Nyberg who does a bit of yes. everything you know it's it's politics it's geography it's culture it's um um and and how the 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 world in the 1930s and 1940s was much more complicated in its connections than perhaps we look at them we look at those atlas maps with this one's yellow yes. this one's blue this one's red and and actually there were these cities around the world that had extraordinary cultural differences and backgrounds and international so but anyway we're going down a rabbit yes. hole already folks so um Brooke has come armed with a PowerPoint that she's in charge of. If we have questions that kind of pertain to exactly what is being discussed kind of on screen, we'll deal with them as we go along. But kind of the big, broader ones about perhaps how the, how the U.S. perceives this chapter of the war, we'll do those at the end. But you, you know the score, folks. We like to read your comments, uh, whether we address them all or not. But basically, over to my guest to take us through this, this really interesting story that I still don't know how to classify on the playlists. Okay, well, you can decide at the end maybe how you would classify it, but I'm going to begin by giving you a little bit of scene setting. Uh, this is an event, the crash of the Yankee Clipper, the last flight and crash of the Yankee Clipper, the Pan Am seaplane. Uh, many of your viewers may know about this incident, but what I'm going to tell you is based on uh, original historical archival research that's never with documents that have never been used before. Um, and I don't think anyone really knew existed until I uh, worked on this. Uh, then I'm going to sort of back up after setting the scene and telling you about this event and tell you what I hope it shows, how I came into the project um, mm -hmm. and, and sort of how I think it connects to these broader conversations you're having here on, on this network. So we're going to start in February of 1943, the middle of World War II, you could say kind of the pivot moment of World War II. And we're going to begin with a, uh, a life, a modern life tragedy that many of you have probably experienced, and that is that the plane was delayed. And so the passengers had to wait. Uh, and by this, I mean, Pan American Airways celebrated a uh, seaplane, the Yankee Clipper, and it was delayed by almost a week. First for maintenance, a backfiring engine, a sticky piston, then crew illness, then weather conditions. But this was not uncommon. Regular transatlantic air service from New York to Portugal, where travelers caught connecting flights to the British Isles, North Africa, and other danger zones, had been running for less than four years, only since the spring before Hitler's forces invaded Poland. Fingerprinted, passported, and vaccinated, 27 passengers and a dozen crew members waited for boarding instructions in their New York apartments or hotel rooms, smoking cigarettes, listening to the radio, and reading the latest about the war. Frank Kewell was anxious to get going. Manhattan was driving him batty. The former Olympic athlete turned export salesman had spent the 1930s living it up as a bachelor in colonial Southeast Asia until he was forced to flee and almost killed during the Japanese invasion. 
Camped out in Greenwich Village, he likely poured over reports about North Africa, where he was now headed. As you know, Operation Torch just happened. Uh, after talking his way into a job as a radio broadcaster and where untested American troops had just been humbled by Rommel's tanks in their first face-to-face -face engagement with the Germans near Tunisia's Kazarine Pass. It rather looks as though I shall be on my way in a few days, he wrote to his sister on February 14. When he got there, he told her she might be able to hear him on the radio every night. He would keep close to the action, and when the drive on Europe began, he would be right up there with the first ones, he said. At her penthouse on uh, just off Central Park West, the Broadway star Tamara Drazen Swan packed her things. A shoe box, a hat box, a suitcase piled with evening gowns, costume jewelry, hair clips, and sheet music. By February 19, she and other members of her USO Camp Shows troop knew that they would be embarking first to England and then to further combat areas to entertain Allied forces. Cultivating the persona of a mysterious Russian songstress, Tamara had been known only by her first name and hiding her Jewish background since 1933 when she became famous for debuting the ballad Smoke Gets In Your Eyes on Broadway. But she often thought about her traumatic escape from war-torn Ukraine in 1920 and the grandmother she left there and who was now by now almost surely gone. At his Upper East Side townhouse, George Spiegelberg, a six foot tall hazel-eyed major on General Eisenhower's London staff, was enjoying a brief reunion with his wife and small children after nearly a year's absence. The stern Republican lawyer was no fan of President Roosevelt and his New Deal, in fact, he had run for Congress against the Democrats in 1934, but he was thrilled to have the wartime overseas commission he had been dreaming about since 1918 when he was stuck stateside learning to fly observation balloons while his older brother found glory as an aviator in France. George had been recalled to, to Washington to defend the merits of Lendley's against skeptics in his own party, but he was now set to return to his post. He also readied his belongings woolen underwear and socks, a shaving brush, vitamins, and a standard issue Colt 45 automatic pistol. The city's newspapers hardly captured the horrors these and, uh, and 36 other Americans would soon be speeding toward at more than 150 miles per hour. In Europe, the Third Reich ruled over a more populated landmass than the United States. Across the continent, Axis leaders were growing harsher and there were reprisals against every hint of resistance, and more than three quarters of the Holocaust victims were already dead. Japan's empire had also reached its outward limits, stretching from Burma to the borders of Siberia and mainland China, across into the U.S. Aleutian Islands, and down to Portuguese Timor, less than 500 miles from Australia. The empire's soldiers now ruled over 350 million or so people, including hundreds of thousands of American and European civilians and POWs confined to rapidly deteriorating camps. Some of these were Frank Kuehl's friends. And the nightmares of that winter extended far beyond the occupied zones. Hunger was stalking millions in China, and London policymakers had just decided to divert more ships from provisioning food short India, setting the stage for famine there that would cost the lives of some three million people. Like a vortex, this war devoured not just battlefields and their soldiers, but everything and everyone in its vicinity. The vast majority of the world's 60 million or more fatalities would be civilians. Hmm. I'm just going to interrupt just yeah. briefly, Brooke, because I'm really—I know you're going to you're going to expand on this later on. But perfect. This idea of how many American citizens were spread around the globe before the war, during the war, because it doesn't sit with the narrative we have of this kind of isolationist—you know, America's not really wanted to get involved. We you know, we we think there was literally a moment when it, you know, December the seventh, when the US suddenly becomes yes. part of this. But, you know, one of the things you're bringing, you're highlighting here is this was already very real for hundreds of thousands of people from the US who were living in the middle of it all across the globe. Yes, absolutely. I mean, one thing I think about, you know, there's this idea that Americans are abroad and they're traveling and they're tourists. And then World War II happens and everyone goes home and stays yeah. home until after the war. And if you look at graphs by economic historians, they'll say, you know, oh, there's a dip. People didn't go abroad during World War I, didn't go abroad during World War II. But that's not right. They just went abroad in other capacities. Uh, and I'll talk about this in a second, that just because you're in uniform doesn't mean you're a combatant. Um, and so, you know, actually, during World War II, there's more Americans abroad than probably at any other moment in American history, which is incredible. 
Um, and only a tiny fraction of those are, are combat soldiers. So yes, one of the things I'm gonna highlight here in a second is uh, the, the way we need to go back well before Pearl Harbor and we need to look at a much more expansive ge you know, geographic uh, scope than, than some of our narratives I think now, now do, especially in American history. Thank you. Okay, so uh, finally on February 21, Pan Am summoned passengers for trip 9035 to LaGuardia's Marine Air Terminal. Reporters and sightseers used to come to watch the airline's giant clippers lift off and land on the Long Island Sound, but now their movements were classified. Japanese forces had overrun Pan Am's string of Pacific bases from Midway to Hong Kong, killing or capturing more than 90 of the airline's employees. So it was not inconceivable that the Axis might target the company's Atlantic network too. The Clippers still displayed commercial registration marks, which were required for safe passage through neutral Portuguese territories. But secretly, the Army and Navy, Navy had commandeered the fleet after the U.S. declaration of war and periodically diverted their crews for military missions. These seaplanes were still the world's only aircraft capable of carrying large payloads across the oceans. Mm. <clears throat> Inside the terminal at the check-in counter, the 52-year-old Harry Seidel handed over a one-way ticket. Harry was a company man who had worked his way up the ladder at Standard Oil of New Jersey. He had been drilling in the oil fields of Oklahoma in the 1910s and then served as an office assistant in Bucharest under German occupation during, the, during World War I. Um, and he worked there to uh, try to preserve Romanian uh, oil fields for standard under that occupation. By the 1920s, um, he had become one of the company's top overseas directors and diplomats. Standard Oil now was facing one of its worst scandals in decades due to congressional hearings about its extensive and ongoing ties to the German chemical corporation IG Farben or IG Farben. But Harry would not relinquish his position. He was returning to his firm's London office. Brokering international oil deals had brought him an uncommon amount of wealth and standing for the son of an immigrant small town bakery owner. Other passengers filed through the terminal steel double doors, some with obvious purpose, others with an air of secret errands. Ben Robertson, a proud Southern Baptist and Democrat with sensitive blue eyes and a lilting South Carolina accent, showed up from his Midtown hotel wearing a silver identification bracelet announcing his new affiliation with the New York Herald Tribune. A seasoned newspaper man, he had reported from Roosevelt's Washington, from London during the Blitz, and from Moscow under the threat of invasion in mid-1942. But witnessing British colonial rule up close in New Delhi during the Quit India campaign just months before had sorely tested his convictions that the Allies were merely fighting the good fight. And he, in fact, risked his press credentials in order to report this and criti criticize the British war effort in India. LaGuardia's security agents took special note of the appearance of Manuel Diaz. Stocky with brown eyes encircled by spectacles, Manuel had co-founded the most important shipping agency in the Spanish-speaking world. Vessels entrusted to his care had plied the waters between New York, Latin America, and the Iberian Peninsula since the First World War and they had been aiding right-wing agents and fascists since at least Francisco Franco's coup, which overthrew the Spanish Republic in the 1930s. Suspected of fascist sympathies, Manuel himself had been arrested for smuggling oil and radio transmitters off a of Brooklyn pier only days after the United States entered the war. But he escaped conviction, and his technically neutral boats still crossed the Atlantic sometimes transmitting information about Allied convoys to German U-boats. Airport inspectors combed through his leather overnight bag, finding suits, handkerchiefs, bedroom slippers, a red cross button, I worry, I wonder all the time about this red cross button, mm. and miscellaneous correspondence, but they found nothing incriminating. So in Pan Am's lounge, the passengers waited. This is Tamara here on the far left, taking a picture with her other USO troop mates. And then shortly before 9.30 a.m., a series of bells rang out, signaling the crew and then the passengers to board. Captain R.O.D. Sullivan from, emerged from the code office, clutching classified data and route instructions, which he would lock in a safe on the flight deck. Rod, or Sully, as colleagues sometimes called the veteran flyer, could maneuver seaplanes more skillfully than just about anyone, 
soaring them over or under bridges and steering them through swells like speedboats stopping on a dime before stopping on a dime. He had joined Pan Am in 1929 when it was still only a risky startup. It would become the, the first international successful international American airline. Um, after he had spent a, the previous decade in Southern California working as a Navy uh, mechanic and flight instructor, as well as stunt doubling for Hollywood film stars and performing test hops on Charles Lindbergh's soon to be famous Spirit of St. Louis. Helping to pioneer Pan Am's Latin American and then Pacific routes during the 1930s, Sully was now commanding secret military missions between South America and Africa, as well as the regular commercial service to Lisbon. With more than 14,000 flying hours under his belt, he had just become weeks before the first person in the world to fly the Atlantic 100 times. Wow. So the passengers followed, followed Sully and the other flight officers outside down the dock. They tiptoed across the Clipper's water wing and stepped into its boat-shaped boat hull. Uh, it was once shining silver. It was now coated in camouflage paint. From the lounge, the stewards directed them left and right into their seating compartments. You can see it's sort of like a like a, a European first class train, like the you know like the Orient Express. Yeah, it's got that there. vibe, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, they deliberately gave it that vibe too to make people feel safe. Like, it, oh, this is just like an ocean liner, or it's just like a train. You know. <laughs> Um, on the upper deck, crew members arrayed themselves at their own workstations, a port side navigator's chart table, the radio operating post, and an engineering desk. In front of them on the master's bridge, Sully and his co-pilot uh, secured the overhead emergency hatch, tested the intercabin phones, and unlocked their controls. With weather forecast double-checked, Sully signaled for the crew to hoist the sea anchor and cast off the mooring lines. As the craft eased away from the dock, he opened the throttles and sped past Rikers Island. After reaching full power, it took roughly 30 seconds for this aircraft model, it was a Boeing 314, to break free from the surface of the water. The motors whined as it climbed away from the channel until about 8,000 feet when Sully leveled the plane off. A course to Bermuda was set. After setting down in that British colonial outpost to refuel, uh, the Clipper would continue overnight through the dangerous mid-Atlantic air gap known as the Black Pit to Horta Harbor in the Azores, uh, the neutral Portuguese Azores. And then the following day, after setting off from Horta and flying all day without incident to Portugal, mainland Portugal, it will crash in Lisbon's Tagus River, killing 24 of the 39 passengers and crew on board. So lives and careers would soon be destroyed in an instant and a great airship to us, kind of a strange type of airship, but a symbol of a distinctive era of American foreign relations would be reduced to scrap. But because the plane crashed, it preserved a special paper trail, which gave hints of two decades worth of personal and political choices that had brought these Americans to this place. So my book traces the backstories of seven people on that plane the seven worldly Americans I just introduced you mm -hmm. to, their personal histories, their politics, and the paths that led them toward war, only two of them would survive the crash. And, you know, I should say you have to read the book to find out. Yeah, it's a spoiler <laughs> alert. That's in the book there to find out. And, and just to, to kind of jump in there, I mean, yeah. I, I've had this, com this very same conversation with quite a few authors on this channel, is that a story like this, when uh, you can explain if you wish how you how you discovered it, you must have had the, that point is why has no one written this one before? I mean, because it's come up several times in sidebar. This is like the cast of a really top Ag Agatha Christie novel. I mean, it, you couldn't make up the variety of backgrounds of these individuals. And yet this is a real a real flight that really took yeah. place. And, and, you, and you have this cast of incredibly worldly people. I mean, did, yeah. did you have that moment? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how I how I got to this flight. But the whole time I was working on this, I was just thinking like, I you know, I couldn't make this up better. Um, and if anything, these people are more interesting than the people I would have made up because we make up stories that are kind of conventional. You know, you, you say, oh, I know that this was important in the war and that was important. So I'll put yeah, someone. You, you find someone who sounds a bit like someone you've already heard about. Kind already, of, I'm going to put oh, Rosie. A bit like gonna, that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to put Rosie the Riveter on the plane and I'm going to put that, you know, and that's yeah. not what these people are like. They're not stereotypes. So the, uh, the individuals profiled here, they're not stand-ins for larger groups. They're complex people 
who are in some ways representative, but in other ways, exceptional. They live lives of contradiction and complication like most human beings. And I hope as their biographies accumulate, intersect, and sometimes work at cross purposes, they defy expectations. They spill out over social categories, national borders, time periods, and other schemes for order. They put flesh and bone to otherwise hard to grasp events of global scope. And they invite those who follow them to revisit even well-known history with fresh eyes. And so here's sort of the crux of what I'm hoping this story is gonna do is mm. together they dramatize how a diverse cast of people were drawn into global crisis, how they navigated an era of unprecedented mobility and perilous interdependence, and how their deep and sometimes contradictory international engagements would, would um, be uh, in turn strengthened or transformed or else in some cases derailed by the US war effort. And I hope too that they situate the early 20th century United States uh, more firmly and richly in the stream of world history. Mm. So I can tell you now you've been asking me how, you know, how did you get to this? And so let me let me just walk you through a little bit of how I came upon this and why I'm doing this. And I can talk to a little bit about why I think nobody's written about this before the 21st century, because it does. The research I did does depend on um, 21st century, um, you know, digitized uh, document databases. We couldn't have done this. We couldn't have we couldn't have researched this story uh, before that. Um, if you went back in time and you told me that I would, a younger me, you know, that I would spend more than a decade researching and writing a book about World War II, I would have told you were absolutely incre <laughs> incredibly crazy, right? I came of age in the 1980s and 1990s when, um, during what Emily Rosenberg, the historian Emily Rosenberg, calls the World War II memory boom, when signs of the good war fought by the greatest generation were everywhere in American culture. Stephen Ambrose books and Steven Spielberg movies, 50th anniversary commemorations of the bombing of Pearl Harbor, video game reenactments of the D-Day invasion. Uh, when the History Channel debuted in 1995, it was so quickly overtaken with Nazi conquering fair that I referred to it with teenage derision as the World War II channel. This was not something that I ever thought that I wanted to work on. Um, to me, the conflict, or at least the way that Americans had come to recount it, had become exceptionally well-traveled ground. You know, when mm -hmm. young historians are taught to find, find, find topics that nobody's worked on before, World War II is definitely not that topic. So it was the last thing I really thought I would do. But then over time, and especially as I began teaching American history, I began to think more about the particularity of these late 20th century American World War II narratives and about what those narratives and their storytelling conventions revealed, emphasized, but also what they obscured or had forgotten. U.S. historians have produced a lot of amazing scholarship on the war. I know you've hosted a lot of these scholars, but the broad synthesis, the meta narratives that have stuck, the ones that get made into movies, like you were saying, right? Mm. Um, they have narrowed considerably over time. And I decided I was dissatisfied with four things, really. First, the way that Americans had reimagined the war as something you could bifurcate into two usually non-intersecting halves, a home front and a war front. Yeah. Um, you can find I this. Agree. Yeah. Yeah. You can find and Brit I think British history is different. And you know, Russian history, Chinese, Chinese history, French history, Brit they have their own ticks and their own you know narrative conventions. But so I'm talking really only about the American version, but the American one is very particularly home front, war front, as though those two things are totally separate places. Um, there's a common refrain you can get in, in history is the men who fought and the people at home. And this leads to um, all kinds of mistaken assumptions about who is where. There's emerging scholarship right now talking about the enormous GI presence in the continental United States. So something like 25% of the US military never left the continental United States and cities like New York and Chicago and San Diego are overrun with troops. So the idea that there's people at home and then the men are away is, is totally not right. Also, as we talked about a minute ago, um, people at home are still going abroad. There's still people who are traveling all over, um, non-combatants. So the idea that you couldn't leave the United States during the war is also something uh, that isn't quite right. So the second thing that bothered me was how the, the war abroad half of the story, the story about the people who fought, the men who fought, um, tended to center only on two main dramas. Um, and military history and military historians in particular uh, focus on liberation stories. I think this makes sense, right? Because military historians study 
you know, what works and what doesn't in battle. And so the primary question driving that literature is how do the allies win? And so you're going to focus on the parts where they're, you know, actually engaged in combat. That's that, that, um, that, um, that liberation story. Um, and um, you have the background there behind you. This is just like- Same photo, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yep. like just that, we, I mean, it's so seared into our brains. It's such an important moment. And there's been incredible work on this, but you know, so much so that it, it's sort of sucked all the oxygen out of the room and in, or like taken it well, away from uh, any other subject. To give you a you know, breathing space, I mean, I know on my channel, shows about 1944 do better than shows about 1942. We, we like yes. to kind of know the outcome already. The 40, 42, 43 period, which I'm now finding, I'm a Normandy guy, I've lived here 22 years, I'm a D-Day right. guy. I'm finding the 42 period more and more fascinating as I get older because I realized there were so many places it could have gone this way, that way. Yes. And it's complicated and nuanced. And yeah. and the you know, D-Day is we're all we're all on the we're all on the same page by D-Day. The 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 allied relationships are pretty harmonious. We're over the rough. You go back to torch and and the Americans yeah. and British, we can't even really agree on what our policy yeah. is about the Mediterranean. Forget about the the, Mid the Middle East and the Far East. We haven't even opened the dialogue about how that's yeah. going to work out. And yet by 44, things are a bit more sorted out. So it's much easier to write about. And I know we're going to expand yeah. on this idea of the Americans being around the world. And, you know, I, I'm just going to relate a story that, that seems like it's got no connection, but it has. When I was going uh, catching Eurostar in Paris uh, in, in March, and it was always to do with passports. And this is not a Brexit story, folks, but it's there's this binary system where European passport holders or non-European passport holders. But the thing is, what they hadn't allowed for is the families that have a bit of both. There were all people in the queue where dad is American, yes. mum is Belgian, and the kids, one kid's got a French passport because that's how he because the dad worked as an ambassador, and the other kid's got an Irish passport. Mm -hmm. And they're all standing again. We don't know where to go. We don't yes. know what the world now and the world then doesn't really consider these people that have yes. different feet in different camps and the, the you know if you're an american living in the philippines married to a filipino person you've got all different types of reasons Absolutely. behind this what if you've got german ancestry you're not german ancestry you're, you're and these we just think to me we just ignore that it's too complicated yes. let's forget about it let's just have it binary you know the gis yes. went off to war the women were making aircraft and let's not talk about the complications does that ring true with you I, more than true, both on a personal level, because I've been in that EU line and not known where to put my daughter and myself. And, right. then, and then also through the people that I'm writing about, they very much have really complex loyalties um, that don't easily fit in these patriotic, exactly. you know, bu buckets that we've been telling the story in. Um, yes. So de most definitely um, true. Um, in addition to this sort of, um, you know, combat history that we know. Um, and one thing that one thing that um, I think about it, American combat history, especially it's been filtered into popular culture. You know, somebody growing up in the 80s and 90s like me, you know, could be forgiven for even knowing there were anybody but Americans in, invading those beaches, right? I mean, Saving Private Ryan, it's all Americans. There's no, even the allies are not the allies. It's, Amer it's an American story. And so, you know, to me, you know, the interconnections between these different nationalities and the divided loyalties and all that stuff is really, really interesting. And you're right. It's it's not comfortable. It's much more comfortable to talk about, you know, liberation stories where you know what's going to happen. But 42 is scary. Nobody knows what's going to happen. And I, I did enjoy writing this book because I'm seeing it through people's eyes where they don't know the outcome. Yeah. And the world falls apart. I mean, it completely falls apart, you know, in 1942. And the, you can hear the panic in their in their in their um, letters and you know in the, in in their speaking and everything and it's it's a different kind of history. It's not as comfortable, um, but it is really interesting. Mm. Um, so in addition to the 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 combat histories, the other thing we often do is we do the high diplomacy history, and this too, I would say, um, Paul, you know, focuses on the latter part of the war, right? This yep. is also sort of the end of the war. It's not um, Sicily, Normandy, Iwo Jima, but it's Tehran, Yalta, Potsdam. Um, and, um, you know, uh, it's, it's Churchill, Stalin, Roosevelt, and, the, and then Truman. And so there's a sense that it's, you know, these the big, high diplomatic discussions are going on, but we don't get a sense of the kind of on the ground diplomacy and foreign relations that are also um, occurring. I once, I once um, talked about this at a, at a conference, and I said, you know, we do the war as either beachscapes or chairscapes. 
And then, uh, <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm writing that one down, bro. Yeah. That's, and then, that's going in the database. <laughs> beach, beach scapes and chairscapes. And then the wonderful Penny Von Eschen, the historian, came up to me afterwards. She says, I bought a commemorative chairscape in Moscow. They sell them. And you can buy the little, like, you know, um, uh, pewter, you know, chairscape or whatever to commemorate wow. this. Um, so, I was so I was upset by kind of like the way that a lot of the geography of the war had fallen out of the story, the chronology, the way it had truncated the war. We focus overwhelmingly on the end of the war. You could say the British uh, his story focuses overwhelmingly on the earlier part of the war when the oh, British stand the Britain. alone. It's you know, Britain the, standing alone. Oh, don't yeah. get don't get me started. I know, I <laughs> that's one of my buttons that you know. Yeah, um, it was on Twitter yesterday. The cartoon, a, a contemporary cartoon from 1940, where two British soldiers then they said. So apparently we're on our own again. The other guy goes, yes, yes with the other 5 million people in the, or 50 million, 500 million in the empire or something. Yes. You know, that, yes. It wasn't even a thing back then. And yet now, but yeah, that, that I, I won't, I'll zip it. Otherwise I'm going to start ranting. But yeah. No, but I, you get, you get run up. You get what I'm saying. There's these sort Completely. of tropes, these narrative tropes that take hold. And just like the British, we stand, we stood alone, you know, in 1940, um, the American version has, become more nationalistic over time too. So if you think about like, say movies about World War II, if you go back to the 60s and 70s, you look at the longest day, tour, 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 films like these, you can see they're marketed as 43 international stars. These are multilingual productions drawing on um, multinational casts, um, groups of directors, researchers, um, you know, they're very international and there's a sense of different kinds of perspectives and things going on. Um, by the end of the 20th century, we do the same story in an extremely American centric way. Um, you know, in Saving Private Ryan, there's there's two Germans in the cast and they're called German one and German two. I think they're you know, we, we've we've lost a sense of of the internationalness of the war, which is crazy. right? I mean, what is a war if it's not if it you know, it doesn't have that kind of mm-hmm. international. Mm-hmm. Um, so so let me give you some. Um, some facts here that kind of cut against this um, Saving Private Ryan kind of, you know, uh, way of thinking about the war. Uh, combat soldiers made up only a small fraction of the millions of Americans, both in and out of uniform, who scattered across six continents on the eve of and during World War II. Long before GIs began storming beaches and beyond the war's most famous battlefields, Americans forged extensive political and economic ties to other parts of the world. This includes both non-combatants in uniforms. One thing I think that's remarkable and it's important to know uh, is that the tooth to tail ratio in the US military is at a peak where you know, the number of combatants versus non-combatants is at a record high. For example, only an estimated 16% of American uniform personnel saw ground combat yep. in World War II. So you know, think of all those other people who are doing other things. We, what, what were they doing? You know, that There's so many amazing stories to be told about. Uh, these folks who are in in uniform but are non-combatants. And civilians are also still traveling abroad throughout the war. Between the spring of 1939 and the fall of 1945, Pan Am's regular transatlantic service alone transported 83,000 non-combatants back and forth across the Atlantic Ocean. Tens of thousands more traveled along the airline's Pacific, Latin American, and African routes. Filing down the game plank went bankers, oil brokers, ordnance experts, physicists, farmers, photographers, purchasing agents, plastic surgeons, civil defense planners, fact-finding politicians, and more. To accommodate this demand, Pan Am doubled its scheduled service to Europe from two times per week in 1939 to four times per week in summer of 1941. That's still a half year before the bombing of Pearl Harbor. After the United States enters the war that December, bookings climbed a further 140%. Between then and August of 1945, the airline's crews flew along regular routes that stretched 90,000 miles and would make more than 18,000 ocean crossings. So reserving a seat on a clipper um, took clout. Um, It took distinguished professional standing, important contacts, and all kinds of deep-seated, taken-for-granted forms of social uh, privilege, right? Uh, there's far more men than women traveling on these on these flights. There's very few Black Americans and other people of color on these flights um, because of the way that the you, you know the the U.S. government privileged certain kinds of people's um, talents over others. But it would be a mistake to assume or imagine that international clipper travel during the war was sporadic, rare, or reserved only for an elite few. 
Pan Am's founding visionary Juan Tripp had named his fleet of seaplanes after the speedy masted merchant ships that had revolutionized ocean trade and travel the previous century. And indeed, what those legendary clippers had done with wind and sails, these airborne successors did with wings and oil, shrinking time and distance, turning weeks crossing the Pacific into days and days on the Atlantic into hours. Passenger demand exploded from the very start of the global crisis because clipper flights made improbable itineraries suddenly possible. They were built for a world not yet paved over with, with runways, right? This is, there's, no run, mm. there's not runways readily available. So if you want to go somewhere, um, these things could take you because they could go anywhere within reach of a river, a lake, or a lagoon. They took Winston Churchill to Washington, D.C. Of course, he insisted on driving, as he, as he does. Uh, they took Roosevelt to North Africa. They took Australian Prime Minister Robert Gordon Menzies around the world. But far less famous figures made up most of the traffic. Bureaucrats, former refugees, or the sons of plumbers and cattle ranchers and others who found themselves thrust by the war into unexpectedly urgent endeavors. Hammering out trade deals, bartering technological know-how, greasing the wheels of allied cooperation, or sometimes conspiring with enemy agents. These were the wars in between people, surfing along far-flung networks of trade, transport, and political maneuvering, knitting the U.S. mainland to the world's other staging zones and battlegrounds in ways that defied simplistic imaginaries like war front and home front. So this is what I wanted to sort of get at once I realized that, that this type of war narrative um, was, wasn't, you know, wasn't being emphasized enough mm. Um, I, I wanted to sort of think about how to portray the first half of the war when things were not certain at all, uh, the mind boggling global canvas on which Americans were operating, uh, the ways in which, you know, their politics weren't all in line. They weren't all in sync with the same and so forth. Um, and I also wanted to emphasize, you know, ways to connect American World War II history with other of World War II around the world to sort of de-provincialize American histories of World War II. And so I thought I could maybe craft um, a story as I told it in early days pitching this um, as less like Saving Private Ryan and more like Casablanca. Mm. Um, I, I think you said you had you had um, Helion earlier talking about Casablanca. We, we did that, yeah. And, and, and just, you know, the idea of the influence the people who've traveled around the world have in, in the social circles that, that the leaders are moving in, because we, we tend to kind of forget that in between the big serious conferences while where, where they're discussing the fate of the known world, there are just functions at the White House and, the, and, and in London and around the world where people are, we would use the word hobnobbing in the UK. Mm -hmm. And that's where you're getting your information. That's where you're getting the latest gossip. And yeah. and, and there's a lot of people in the governments who were very, very busy and were, in London, you know, in the Ch Churchill war rooms for half of the war. Yeah. It's the people who are traveling the world. I mean, did you hear what the latest buzz is coming from Tunisia or in Morocco? They're saying this and how, you know, I was on the streets of, uh, you know, Sydney, Australia, and Melbourne. They're saying this about the, we, we can't um, underestimate how much of that opinion was circulating in these circles by people that you're such as you bring up in the book yes. who are, who are traveling. It's, it's, yes. it's traveling is getting inside, isn't it? It is. And, you know, that makes me think too about, you know, um, historians have, have argued, and I think this is right, that one of the reasons why the allies win the war, I mean, besides, you know, the, the, you know, the production and all the, all the things we point to, they point to the fact that allied leaders um, were, were capable of taking criticism and changing course and sort of, you know, yeah. collaborating. They were there. Yeah. Yeah. And the collaborating in a way that the Axis powers did not. And, and that depends on this kind of circulation, not just of information, but also criticism and dispute. Um, and, and so the, the ability of the allies to adapt means that that first part of the war is catastrophic for them, but they're able to, you know, they're able to, you know, regroup, I guess you could say. Mm. Um, and, and that's an important, you know, we've, we talk about a lot on this channel about the technological improvements as the war went on and how aircraft went from being, you know, string bag and ceiling wax to, to well, the British had jets in 1945 and 40, well, so did the Germans. But just the art of being able to discuss complicated issues with people from other nations, as you said there, the Germans, Italians and Japanese, thankfully for the free world, were just not very good at cooperating on that level. They, yeah. they had, of course, their diplomatic, you know, connections, but... Mm -hmm. 
it, it, it didn't it didn't um didn't foster any any real benefits for them whereas you know over the course of the war the us and the britain they get to know it it's like dating isn't it it's like yeah. the first date was 1939 and by 1945 you know, we've 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 been through all the baggage. We've found about all the previous relationships we've had, if you like. I'm going to carry on the, <laughs> the couple dating analogy yeah. there, and we've got to the point where they're able to work with each other. And you add yeah. Canada and Australia and New Zealand to the mix as well. Well, that comes by just learning how to do it and by yeah. by making the mistakes along the way. Yeah, and they're not just dating; they've moved in. They're sharing bank accounts, like you yeah, know. I mean, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The exactly. sharing of the sharing of materials. Really oh, you're interesting. carrying on that analogy. I like that. That's good. <laughs> we're, we're riffing now. Yeah. <laughs> so okay, so so I decided I wanted to do this kind of like a Casablanca story, and my first thought for the book was to do like a book about non-combatants abroad, and I would do sort of chapters on different kinds of people. So I thought, okay, I'll have them correspondence, and then a chapter on businessmen, and a chapter on relief workers. But there was something really deeply unsatisfying about that to me. And I, I decided that I thought it was just replicating this what I already knew, right? Because I would have to decide who I thought was important. Then I would go and find a person I thought was representative of that type of person. It was a self-fulfilling prophecy is basically how I thought right. about structuring a book uh, that way. Um, this is, of course, a common way we do biographies because uh, we write about figures we deem important in respect, in, in, re in retrospect, right? We, we decide someone's important and that's why they deserve a biography. And also people who, of course, you know, decide that they themselves are important and leave us an archive to work with, yeah. right? So, um, but because we have digitized over the past decade, um, so many historical documents, um, vast amounts of documentation from census sheets to phone books, to yearbooks, to newspaper articles, passport applications, all of this, has opened up an opportunity to push at the boundaries of biographical method and research. Who you can research, who you, whose biography you can write, I think is very different now than it used to be because you can find people in a way that you couldn't find them before unless they had already been deemed important by an archive by themselves mm. and so on. So I thought, what if instead of approaching people as archetypes, you know, the foreign correspondent, the, you know, the nurse or whatever, what if I instead saw them as modes of inquiry what if I began with a randomized sampling of individuals who had been caught up in a shared tragedy and then let them decide the roots, the topics, the chronologies I follow? I was thinking here a little bit about John Hershey's Hiroshima, um, but also uh, fic fiction works like uh, Thornton Wilder's The Bridge of San Luis Rey, which does what my kind of like what my book does, which it it um, it begins with a, a tragedy in that in that case, a fallen bridge. But then it goes back to recover the backstories of the people who were involved. Um, and I thought, you know, if I do this and I weave together multiple biographies, this might yield up uh, productively dissonant accounts. I wouldn't get a kind of master narrative. I would get accounts that conflicted with each other. And I also thought it would be a way to tell a story with global scope, but not in a kind of bird's eye abstract way, but in a way that felt satisfying and textured because you can really feel things through people's eyes, it, you know, it, rather than me just making big you know, blousy statements about large swaths of, of history to feel it from a person. It feels um, more uh, visceral, I think. Uh, historians often um, do micro histories like this uh, to write evocatively about times and places that lack extensive records. But I thought, you know, World War II is almost over documented, but this is a way to kind of wind through all the material um, and find my way to source material because I'm looking for very specific things to, to sort of tether the story to these individual people. So once I decided on this, I began uh, investigating commercial aviation. It didn't take long at all to find the crash of the Yankee Clipper. Due to wartime restrictions, newspapers did release some of the names of some of the passengers on board. But a trip down to the Pan Am archives at the University of Miami turned up all kinds of incredible material. Classified passenger and crew manifests, survivor testimony from those who survived the crash, the pilot's personnel file, the investigation by Pan Am and, um, and, and so forth. Um, and so I began to run down the 39 passengers and crew um, that were on this plane. Uh, and I could find about a dozen of them, I would say, that seemed possible to trace in any kind of way. And then over time, as I was researching these, uh, these dozen people, I uncovered much more about some of them than I originally anticipated. And so I began to narrow the cast down to the people whose biographies started bounding off in the, in the most interesting and different 
direction. So you said this before, but I often talk about it this way. It was like chasing rabbits down rabbit holes mm -hmm. um, and sort of seeing where they where they go. Because I would, you know, I didn't decide what the story was going to be. I let them sort of tell me about that. And each of these people proved um, a real unique challenge to research. I'd be happy to talk more about that if people are, are interested. Uh, but I think together, hopefully, they illuminate a series of um, points about the American war experience. Uh, not least, they highlight the degree to which transnational connections, many of them forged long before the bombing of Pearl Harbor, informed and shaped the actions of not just interventionist politicians like FDR's emissaries and so forth, or anti-fascist foreign correspondents, who we do get histories of a lot, but all kinds of Americans. Americans in this era, even many of those who their critics labeled as isolationists, were remarkably cosmopolitan. In fact, they were curious and worldly in ways that Americans would no longer need to be after the United States emerged as a superpower at the end of the war. This is my point here is a bit counterintuitive because we imagine that often we think Americans were sort of minding their own business and trying not to be involved in the world until the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And then, okay, fine, they're reluctant heroes, they win the war, and now they're gonna be internationally engaged after the war. In some ways that I think the opposite is true because before the war, they are, they are powerful, but they're not the, you know, superpower. Mm. They have to learn foreign languages. They have to engage with other people on, you know, on in their own rights. And after the war, Americans, everybody's going to learn English. Well, they don't have to do that. They don't have to come to people. People come to them. And so I feel like American culture becomes more insular, less worldly in certain kinds of ways after World War II than it was before. But that's a counterintuitive way of thinking about things based on a lot of our, our, um, our narratives. If I look at these seven people here, um, all of them were uh, a child. Oh, sorry. All but one of them were a child or a grandchild of immigrants. And two of them were immigrants themselves. Between them, they spoke almost a dozen different languages. Uh, we can look at the stories of each of them really briefly. Uh, Tamara was a Russian speaking Jewish refugee from Ukraine who immersed herself in the leftist politics of New York. George was an uh, elite old stock German Jewish uh, from a, a, a very elite New York family with also family members still in Germany. Uh, but he was also a part of this sort of um, uh, so-called Republican Eastern establishment. Uh, and so he saw Anglo-American law and constitutional government as the world's best hope for civilized peace. Uh, and he was involved in the preparedness movement, both in World War I and World War II. Frank came from a family of Czech speaking immigrants uh, from Bohemia. He spent the 1930s living in Manila, Singapore, Batavia, and he traveled extensively across Asia and the Middle East, uh, where he became deeply committed to the project of Western colonialism. Harry was the son of immigrants from Dresden who spent World War I in Romania, including in a Bucharest cell for a while um, when he was briefly detained for commercial, commercial espionage. After the war, he moved to Paris, where he headed up Standard Oil's foreign producing department's uh, office there. And then he became one of the company's top negotiators, brokering important deals in Iraq, the Dutch East Indies, and other places. Sully came from a family of poor Irish Catholic immigrants. Uh, after he joined Pan Am, he lived in Panama. He you know, flew all around Latin America. And I think um, he may have been one of the Pan Am pilots who was secretly smuggling uranium out of the Belgian Congo during wow. World War II. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Manuel was a Spanish Catholic uh, who had immigrated to New York City. He had ex extensive ties not only to the Iberian Peninsula, but also Mexico, Cuba, and South America. Um, and he used those connections to further the aspiration of Franco and Spain's fascist inspired Falang Party. Now, Ben is the only non immigrant of the bunch. He was a Southern Baptist, Baptist who could trace his roots back more than two or three generations. He had a fierce loyalty to the U.S. Confederacy, and this gave him a kind of strange uh, perspective as well. During the 1920s and 30s, he worked in Hawaii, Australia, and Java, uh, and he took newspaper assignments that took him to Europe, Guam, Aruba, and elsewhere. So none of these people needed uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor to wake up to world affairs. It's just that they didn't agree uh, about which wars to fight, about when and which sides to join. Uh, they disagreed about diplomacy and military strategy, the purpose of government, the place of women and people of color in American society, the role of the press, you know, the merits of communism and capitalism, the future of the planet's colonies, colonies everything. They rooted for different political parties, uh, different empires, different futures. They were haunted by different 
enemies and different wars past. I find it very interesting how each of them kind of comes into World War II with a previous war as their sort of template. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so Ben could not escape his thoughts about his own Confederate ancestors' experiences during the U.S. Civil War when he travels through Britain, Russia, and India. And this opens him up, and he thinks it makes him a better witness to, to the, the experiences of people facing an invasion, right? Because the Yankees invaded the South. Um, but it also puts limits on his willingness to reconsider his own society's white supremacy. And so even though he becomes very anti-colonial, um, he sticks by Jim Crow and, and disenfranchisement of Black Americans in, in, the, in the South. Manuel similarly um, bristled over uh, past wars between Spain and Los Yankees, right? I mean, in 1898, Manuel was a child when the United States went to war with Spain and took away all of Spain's remaining colonies. And this was a blow. You know, Spanish children were raised to, you know, resent this. Los Yankees were the enemy. Um, so that war uh, and the Spanish Civil War helped to explain Manuel's uh, pro-Axis uh, positions, I think. And putting all these individual stories next to each other also highlights how these passengers' war experiences hinged on different turning points. Uh, Americans always, you know, see Pearl Harbor as the beginning. And then what, do, what would you say, Paul, like, as what would be like, the is it Normandy or is it like Sicily or, you know, there are these turning points that we, we sort of hinge the I, I, I don't like I don't like the concept of there being single turning points. There are lots of lit little points that when you add them together, 42 was in itself a, four, a turning point, but then you could make the same case about 41 and 43. Yeah. I think, you know, it's it, one of the things we've talked about is the fact that we don't like having more things than one happening on the timeline. So, so February 43, yeah. for example, and that, you know, it's, we, we can't deal with the fact there's things happening in North Africa and the Eastern front as it's like, no, we can only deal with one thing at a time. So, so June the 6th, 44 is, is D day in Normandy yet the day yeah. before they'd liberated Rome, but we can't handle that. That's too no, much. No, I can't talk about that. Too, no, we, and so I, the turning points are for me are problematic anyway. And yet, and yet you have to somehow, mark these points to understand yeah. the progression you have to say well it was here it was we were there at this point and by this point we're in a different place but exactly yeah. where the change was yeah it's so it's hard to say but yeah no i'm, I'm with you i'm with you uh, yeah, on there's, this there's, concept there's too many wars going on and and so you know how do you hold them all together in your head and i think it's interesting because i when you look at these people here the, there's different moments that matter really substantially to them than others. So Harry, um, who is doing business with the Germans, the Anschluss, right, in 1938 yeah. is pivotally important. It's when his company doubles down on their business with the Germans instead of beginning to pull back from, from them. Uh, for Ben, it's the Blitz in 1940, where it, he, he sort of has, it's, it's a kind of like a rebirth experience for him, and he really commits to the Allied cause. Uh, for Tamara and other Russian-speaking leftists in New York City, the Hitler-Stalin pact turns yeah. the world upside down. I mean, it's, you know, yeah. And then the invasion of the Soviet Union, that's going to be like the event, you know. And so I, I find it interesting how different things matter to these people. Frank, for example, when the Netherlands is invaded, he's he's on Java at that point. So this Dutch colony all of a sudden is like, oh, my, you know, the metropole's gone. Um, and so having multiple turning points matter for different people, I found sort of sat a satisfying way to tackle that problem of like how to narrate turning points without mm. privileging some over others. But so the crisscross movements, uh, they remind us, too, of the critical role of different kinds of territories in the war. So Manuel's shipping routes remind us of the importance of neutral territories as go-between spaces for intelligence gathering and intrigue. Um, you know, a lot of the shipping going, for example, you talked about Torch recently, going to North Africa goes via the Caribbean and South America. Those aren't out of the way. They're on the way to the war, yeah. you know. Um, and those, you know, those sea lanes are full of intrigue. Um, and also, I think, highlights how much this war was a war of imperial mobilization. So looking at Sully and the Pan Am, uh, other Pan Am pilots tapping the resources of Africa, not only uranium from the Belgian Congo, but all kinds of other precious metals and minerals uh, that they were um, using colonial labor to extract. Um, this, And of course, all of that starts before the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Frank, uh, who's in South, Southeast Asia, thinking about the tin and rubber and quinine and other um, you know, resources of Southeast Asia, um, that to me is really um, exciting and interesting that we often forget about. So different events and different terrains captured their attention, broke their hearts or steadied their resolve. And following them encourages us to think more subtly about the chronologies and geographic imaginaries that we use to talk about the war.
because hindsight can teach us how and why the allies won the war, but thinking forward in time through the eyes of individual individuals instead dramatizes how much Americans headed into the conflict, not with ultimate victory in view, but still grappling with the fallout of previous global conflicts and still consumed by the passions and partisan divides of the 1920s and 30s. It brings to life the singular emotions as well as the contingencies and the unknowns of the war's early years. And it offers a reminder of how compromising and complex this war was. And it drives home how quickly the world and human lives can fall apart. So I can stop there. I can tell you a little bit more about the plane flight. It's totally up to you. <laughs> um, well, let's start with the, the question you kind of want to be answered, which is how on earth do you begin this research? I mean, it's difficult enough. So my friends who research a particular Italian in World War II and you think, OK, well, let's start with the, the, the after action reports. But you've already said, was it 12 languages these people speak and they yeah. have, you know, connections across the world? I mean, obviously, lots and lots of contacting of lots and lots of archives. But w yes. was it? I guess that's the well. I'll let you explain. How the hell did you go about this? You know, it's interesting. I mean, every single person presented a different kind of problem. Mm -hmm. So, for example, Tamara went by a single name, Tamara, and you cannot word search that. <laughs> yeah, not easy. Yeah, yeah. That's not, that's not very easy. So, if you want to try to word search Tamara, you're you're going to come up empty. But because the plane crashed they kept the passenger manifest. I only have this passenger manifest because of the investigation that happened after it. And because she's flying internationally, they have her full legal name. And because the flight crashed, they, I, they also have the contact of her father, right? Because they're trying to notify next of kin and so forth when, when the plane goes down. And her father, so one of the things I learned to do very quickly is to not just research the individual, but to research everybody around them that I could. So her father, Boris Drazen, it turns out was a socialist activist um, uh, in the IW, IWG, the International Lady Garment Workers Union, um, the ILGWU. Um, and he started a socialist commune in New Jersey. <laughs> because he did that, Rutgers University decided that his papers were worthy of acquisition. So they, they acquired his papers and his papers don't just document this commune, they also document a father tracing his daughter's, you know, burgeoning career on Broadway. And so once I had that, that gave me a kind of core to work with her. And you were talking about the problem of languages. Well, she wrote to her parents in Russian using some Yiddish interspersed with some English constructions. Well, I don't know Russian. So I, I ended up employing um, a, a Russian history PhD student to translate those, those papers for me. So that's one way to get around that. Um, other people, um, so Manuel is a good example. So Manuel, obviously, he's up to all kinds of stuff that he doesn't want anybody to know about. It's not like he's do donated his papers to a university so we can look back and see all the smuggling he did. And um, I wasn't going to work on him, uh, but then I, 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 you know, did my due diligence and I researched him and I could find records of him getting in trouble with Congress during the Spanish Civil War because he was smuggling stuff to Franco's forces and blocking the loyalists from sending their stuff from like Mexico and other places that was trying to supply the Republic. And so uh, Congress gets, you know, in an uproar about this, he's violating American neutrality and we should kick him out of the country. They don't, they end up not kicking him out. And then also I could find through word searching um, newspaper databases, his arrest in December of 1941, when they arrest him and his partner for smuggling um, oil, silk, armored cable and other goods out of Brooklyn. Um, but then after that, I couldn't find him anywhere. Manuel Diaz is a very common name. It was also not a yeah. good word searchable name. And so I didn't know if I could actually work on him. And then I was started researching other Spanish shippers in New York at the time, just to see if maybe that could like shake something loose. And I found a letter he had written on behalf of a colleague that had his letterhead on it for his shipping firm. And on that, it listed which shipping companies he worked for. And it's these little piddly, you know, shipping companies but I thought, wait, maybe I can maybe I can research the shipping companies, and then I realized that I can figure out what ships he serviced because it's a it's a kind of a small collection of like a half dozen ships that regularly troll these routes that he was the agent for from New York, and so once I figured out the ships that he was the agent for, the U.S. Navy, um, the British, um, you know. Um, transport division, the, you know, the, um, the U.S. consulate on, in Bermuda, everybody has files on these ships. <laughs> and then in those files is information about him. 
so that was how I cracked him was to just start following the ships and then um, and figuring out where where he went. And so every single person kind of presented a different problem. And then some of the languages I I can I know I taught myself some Spanish so I could do the work on Manuel. I went to I went to Madrid where the Madrid archives actually yielded up some helpful material because he was less quiet about what he was doing to the to the authorities in Franco Spain. Um, but you know every single it took a lot of you know, looking for needles and haystacks, but it was, but it was fun. You know, it was kind mm. of like a mystery. <laughs> and yet, how did you then know when to stop? Because you get to a point where the rabbit hole is taking you to a place you don't need to go. Um, you yeah. know, in the did, you know, the, the, these ideas, the things you wanted to convey about the about America's involvement in the war and the, the, the had you kind of formulated those themes early in the writing process mm. or later? Is it? And did that kind of help you hone in? And well, this the fact he well, I don't know he 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 shopped in this particular shop in, in it's, it's irrelevant. You know, I need I need yeah. to stop there now. Yeah. Um, one thing that I realized um, in the middle of it was that I was think I what I was doing I've decided was not biography. It was micro history, and yeah. the difference there being that you know a traditional biography a biographer feels compelled to deal fully deal fully with somebody's life from cradle to grave right to to sort of tell you about every single important episode in their life and all the turning points and sometimes you know sometimes when you read a biography you feel like the writer has literally you know chrono chronologized every single paper to do with that person yeah paper by paper through that you know then they said this and then they wrote to this person and then they went like you said they went to this shop and then they went to that shop and also they usually decide you before they even put pen to paper whether they like the person or not Right. Which totally affects the, you know, we, we see it with the Montgomery's and the MacArthur's, you know, you, you, yeah. you, I'm two pages. And I know this the guy hates the person. So, yeah, OK, yeah. it doesn't mean it's 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 not worthwhile, the book, but, you know, he's coming out from an agenda. But someone yeah. just said it in the sidebar, sidebar that I go back and find it. it. Brooke would have made a great police detective, said James, <laughs> in that you don't you know, you're going where the evidence leads you as opposed to having a pre conceived idea of, of of guilt or whatever it would be you're just you're just seeing where these stories take you and then in turn using them to tell a tell a much bigger story but i think we ought to perhaps just briefly sum up the crash because obviously the the the, the fact that you had the information is because the crash was reported one of the questions i get in in normandy a lot is about the number of aircraft that came down is why did they not investigate what caused that c-47 to come down i go because so many are coming down they can't yeah. investigate them all. They record who went down where, but the cause is is often not cited. Now, this is not military, of course, but yes. The the in terms of the investigation to the crash, just run us through that brief, then we can perhaps do some questions. So the crash well, so I can I can tell you, I can sort of narrate to you how the plane goes down, or I could tell you like what actually happened, like what I think actually happened, which I, I sort of save for the end of the book. But okay, well, tell us what well, however you want to do it. You do it how you want to do it. Um, so, okay, well, the, the plane, when it comes into land, there are there are certain protocols that Pan Am has in place for these planes to land. And Sully, the pilot, um, and the way that I structure the book, the, um, the, the, the intro starts with the plane taking off, and then um, the chapters go back in time to different moments in people's histories. And then there's interludes where you get back on the plane and the plane goes from New York to Bermuda, Bermuda to the Azores, and then Azores to Lisbon, and then it crashes in 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 the in the conclusion. Oh, and what I wanted to say though about the biography thing before I go on to this was that I decided I wasn't going to write biography, and this was liberating because instead of deciding, I had to um, I had to sort of account for every moment in each person's life. I wasn't going to do that. I was going to pick moments to sort of center and flesh out because because it's mo multiple people too you 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 read about one person for a minute and then you put them down and the chapter goes to another person so some people have chapters that deal with their childhood some of them don't some of them mm. i say like two one sentence about their childhood and so instead of working from a kind of comprehensive mentality where i'm going to comprehensively give you this person's life i started at the best parts and wrote outward from them so, you know, I know I want to have Frank's story of fleeing the Japanese invasion on Java, right? That's a, that's a gift. Yeah. So I write that first. I write that chapter first. Um, and, you know, so I wrote the chapters that I knew I wanted first. And then I started writing around them, filling the story in. So you could get a whole sense of the person and their politics. But it wasn't like you had to know everything they ever did. And I didn't use every document that I found. 
Um, so that was sort of how I balanced that endless research problem and also the possibility of producing something that's kind of boring, right? <laughs> By telling you everything someone did is I thought I'm, I'm going for episodes that I want to center and, and use to flesh out. So that's what the chapters are like. And then the, the intro and then the interludes and the conclusion chart the flight. And in the, in the conclusion, I explain how, you know, how the plane comes down in the course of the interludes too, you learn about the pilot and the way that I tell his story in the interludes is to tell you first about his public persona. He was very famous. Um, at the time, he was one of the pilots who pioneered the flights across the Pacific. With he was with Ed Ed Music and um, and Noonan, right? Who leaves to go with Amelia Earhart and fly around the world. Um, there's all kinds of you know video of them flying these these test flights across the Pacific. Um, and Pan Am did a you know a really um, thorough job of trying to mythologize and promote their pilots as these sort of you know larger than life you know, incredible characters. And especially as they started taking on passenger traffic on these over ocean flights as professionals, diligent, this is routine. This is not, this is safe. It's not, they're not dare, daredevils, you know, they're, they're professionals. And so I give you his sort of public persona. Then the second interlude, I give you his private life. And then the last interlude, I tell you a little bit more about what he was really like, because over the course of my research, I discovered that he was quite the renegade and he over time became very frustrated with Pan Am's growing set of protocols, because you know flight, as you you know as you know, early on is like barnstorming. There's no rules. People are going wherever they want. But over the course of the 30s, it gets professionalized and it gets bureaucratized. And he chafed at this. He didn't like to have to wear the uniform. He didn't want to have to wait for clearance to take off and all of this stuff. So his um, personnel file is littered with um, incidents of insubordination and, you know, cowboy type behavior. And so I hope the reader like sort of sees him as this one, you know, wonderful persona in public, and then his private life. And he's such a good dad, you know, and, the, and at mm -hmm. the end, you start to sense, oh, this guy plays by his own rules. And then the conclusion, um, he makes some decisions where he decides he's not going to follow protocol. Um, and so when he's landing, he's supposed to come and flight. He's supposed to come in straight and he likes to make a fancy swerve when he lands. So he likes to come in and go doop with the wing and just kind of dip it. And he came in at dusk and the way that landing on water is, it's very difficult to judge the height of where you are in relation to the water. If there's yeah. no white caps and at that time of day, and I go into this in the conclusion, all the things that they do to, to sort of mitigate this, this danger. Um, and he just ignores a lot of protocols and he clips the wing. And so it takes it spirals out of control. Um, and there is a CAB investigation. There's an investigation by the Portuguese authorities. There's an investigation by the U.S. legation. George Kennan is actually there. He's, he's an officer at the Lisbon um, legation at the time. Um, and there's an internal Pan Am investigation. Um, and, and so um, there's a lot of material that, that was accumulated. And um, you're right. In in combat, you know, I don't know that you could you could tally all the plane crashes that occur, but this was special. I mean, this was, mm. you know, the Pan Am Clipper. It's like, you know, it's like it's like if the Queen Mary like yeah, it, it, it had a status that it's hard for us 2023 to understand, you know, what it was back then. Like like the Orient Express kind of yes. you know, has sort of almost a comical re regard now, reputation. But actually, it was. It was incredibly. People knew about the Orient Express across the kind of the known world. They didn't know. Yes. It, it, it was. It was. It was known. And and these these flight these aircraft were known. People knew. But this is the kind of thing that filled those science magazines and the, you know being sexist yes. boys magazines were, were were about. This is what you know. Trans in, into transatlantic flights are doing, and people, you know, the cutaway. I think you know your next slide. I think is a cutaway, isn't it? This yes. is the kind of thing that would have filled up those kind of books. So this is mm -hmm. how it's both demonstrating wealth and sophistication, technology, mm -hmm. but also it's aspirational, isn't it? It's showing this this is the world we can yeah. live in. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it captured so many imaginations. It's kind of remarkable how much um, these clippers are now forgotten, given how yeah. romanticized they were you know, in the thirties and forties. Um, and, and actually, ironically, the reason is because of World War II, because the war built the world an extensive network of runways. Yeah, of right. Course. And the reason yeah, yeah. why we had, I mean, runways were World War II products. And so once you had paved over the whole world, really, because you've got these transport networks that are going across, you know, Africa and Latin America and, you know, everywhere that you could get to had runways. 
you don't need seaplanes anymore. And it's easier to, to run land planes. They don't, you know, get stuck in frozen yeah. harbors. They don't rust the same way. Um, and so these, these clippers were made obsolete by World War II. And every single one of them is scrapped um, by 1951. Wow. Well, it's, not, it's interesting because at the beginning of the show, there were sort of questions flying in about the sort of technical aspects of how much was a, a ticket and things like that. And then uh, they got to the point where people just started listening and people were saying, I'm just, I'm too busy to type now, I'm listening. And I think that the fact the conversation moved to this this bigger subject, which I've, I've personally loved, but there are a couple of questions that we'll ask. And this is a really interesting one. You talk about the research you did. So Gary August is a regular who saying, were there any dignitaries or anybody that missed or changed the plans and didn't catch the aircraft that, that might have steered things a different way? Yes. Um, on this flight, there were three. Well, so, OK, on the flight, the actual flight, there were 12 U.S. Army officers who were traveling incognito as civilians because military officers are not supposed to be flying commercial aircraft through neutral territories. So they are flying incognito. They have, you know, made up passports that say civil servant on them. Um, there were three other U.S. Army officers, including Hayes Croner, who's a who's a pretty big, big wig in the world of military intelligence, who was booked for the flight and got switched to a different flight at last minute. Wow. So at some point I did consider looking at the three, those three officers that didn't make it on and putting them in and then having them like not be on the plane you know, <laughs> towards the end. But the problem is, the military officers were the hardest to research of all because they were not in any um, any public releases because if, if people found out there were military officers on these planes, then they would be liable to be shot down. Yeah, uh, yeah, because the, legitimate, it's a legitimate violation target. of- Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, complicated, and yeah. So the, um, and so the US Army officers, uh, the fact that they were on this flight was so hush-hush, they actually, even the release numbers of people on the plane was wrong because they basically just pretended like they weren't on there. Um, I, they buried them, uh, the ones who died in the crash, they buried them in Lisbon civilian cemeteries, the British cemetery and the Jewish cemetery in Lisbon, because they couldn't even admit in death that they were military. Um, and um, the one who one who survives, George, who I write about, um, they, the U.S. government keeps writing his wife saying, do not tell anyone where he is or he will be interned because mm -hmm. he's convalescing in, in the, you know, Lisbon hospital. Um, so the, the U.S. military officers were really hard to pin down, and I couldn't find out what they were doing because, of course, a lot of them were on classified missions. Um, you know, it's kind of it's kind of wonderful to think about, like all the stories that could have been in there that I couldn't find. The one I did work on, George, I only could work on him because I found his daughter, and I went wow. and I talked to her, and I said, you know, do you know anything about your your father's war service? And she, you know, she let me come to her house and rummage through her basement. And look at his war papers, his all, you know, his orders and his scrapbooks. And then from that, I, you know, you know how World War II, you know, the bureaucracy is so intense. So then I could say he's in the general board of the purchasing agent of this and that. And then I could go into the British archives, I could go into the American archives and find that our office and then find him. Because you can't just word search his name into those, you know, you have to know which office and which branch and this. And, and so I was able to recover his story. But the other officers on board, I don't, I don't know what they were, what they were up to. And I think it's it's kind of intriguing. Um, to imagine uh, what other kinds of activities they were engaged in. So definitely. And um, well, I mean, the, the feedback is coming in. Uh, people have ordered the book already. James Murphy said this channel keeps getting better and better as it goes, um, <laughs> which is nice. And, it's, you know, you talked about what the themes you wanted to bring up. And, and I like the fact you, you said that the, your earlier self would have been surprised you writing uh, about World War II at all. And, you know, for, for our viewers here, I think you've 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 sold what the book is about, but this this idea of opening ourselves up to how complex the war was and for people's reasons behind it, I don't. I think in some ways we're not ever going to stop. The, the The narrative is is a steamroller now, and we're not going to really affect the the saving Pratt Ryan greatest generation idea. But we kind mm. of chip away at it a little bit mm. and, and and realize that it is way more complex. And I think. If you want to say any final words about about how we should be looking at the USA in that kind of 41, 42 period as, mm -hmm. as being far more around the world than, than we think of it. Anything kind of concluding remarks about that you want to share? Yeah, I mean, one thing I think about, you know, in terms of World War II history and memory, we, you know, the narratives that we embrace are ones that speak to our own needs, right? And yep. it makes a lot of sense to me why, you know, Saving Private Ryan is an incredible piece of work and that that narrative is incredibly powerful for really good reasons. And I, 
you know, I'm, I'm also drawn to that. I'm not against that. It was in the, that was the right narrative at the right time in the right place. And that was the late, you know, the late 20th century in the wake of the Vietnam War, when Americans are looking for narratives that aren't, you know, the kinds of really, you know, dejected, you know, narratives that the Vietnam War was lending itself to in, mm. in, in American memory. Um, and so it makes sense that people turn to this kind of narrative. And then also that's a moment when um, a lot of these uh, veterans are, are dying off. And so a lot of really good oral history work was being done. A lot of documentary, you know, documentary work was being done. And it was the right moment to sort of honor those sacrifices and that incredible experience of combat that, that these men had gone, gone through. So it makes, makes really good sense to me that that moment felt that way. I think about where we're at now, both the United States, but also the world and, and the kinds of challenges that we face in the 21st century from, you know, threats to democracy worldwide, um, environmental perils. These are the types of things that I think we need to think not just nationalistically about, but also in terms of international cooperation and engagement. And so maybe World War II stories that stress this sort of world on a precipice, you know, yeah. world in danger. And um, like you said, how these groups of folks who have different ideas and different needs do get together and 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 well, do. That, yeah, to me, that's the message for the minute for the future. And one of the other things that really gets me on, because I'm a middle aged guy, I get grumpy about many things, is that when people say the veterans wouldn't have wanted this or the veterans would have liked that. And I go, how many veterans have you spoken to? Because I can tell you the ones I knew had as many different views about things as, as everybody else on the planet. And they're running up the beaches of P Peleliu and Normandy for mm. all sorts of things, uh, partly just because they were they were drafted. They, they didn't, but they were they, they. Some were thinking about um, a better work environment. Some were thinking about improving the lot of their of their of their race. Their others yeah. were thinking about. But to put a single voice to them is is mm -hmm. is dangerous. And I think we we're going back to this original con discussion we had earlier about this. This, the, the idea we have America wasn't behind the war until Pearl Harbor and then America was behind the war as if there was, you know, a switch just came on like, a, and it was never any, anything as, as simple as that. Like any more that the, 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 the Britain had a blitz spirit, these, these ridiculous things. People were very grumpy during the blitz because their houses are being blown up. So, yeah. you know, being cheerful because the King speaks to you on the radio only goes so far when you're clearing up the rubble of your, your, your grandmother's house and she's dead. It's not easy to maintain a blitz spirit. So I think we're at an era now, as we say goodbye to the veterans to be, to understand the reasons why people were doing things were complex. The, yeah. the, the allegiances that people were adopting, the sides people were picking. It was never as, as, as simple yeah. as, as the way we put it. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to let you talking about Chris Millington, my friend who does shows on the channel about the resistance. He says mm. we're burdened by the words resistance and collaboration. They come yeah. so with, with all this ideas, what we mean, you know, resistance is wearing a beret, going out and blowing up trains and collaboration is, is herding a pilot off to the Gestapo headquarters for cash. And he prefers um, defiance and accommodation. Mm. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, because because resistance can be listening to a radio you're not supposed to. That is an right. act of defiance and collaboration can be being forced to work for the occupier or That's your right. family will be shot. So it's out. It's understanding that there's a, a much wider range of reasons. And it seems to me that these people you talk about are just allowing us to understand that, yeah, it wasn't quite as neat. Right. If, if and we I had think trade interests. And I think getting away from personifying nations, right? So America did yeah. this, and you know, well, I don't know who that person is, you know. That. And so when you get down to the level of individual stories, it does it does help you understand why people would do a thing that maybe doesn't make sense to us now. Or um, and also and talking about honoring the veterans, the vast majority of them were not combat soldiers. So yeah. you know, thinking about how, what it took to wage this war and the kinds of other, the other kinds of labor that went into this, you know, um, I've had a lot of veterans who say, oh, well, yeah, I was in India or I was here and I was doing this thing and or my, you know, my dad or my grandpa or whatever was doing this thing. And I didn't, you know, I've never seen anybody talk about those things. They always know. I mean, even, even on that, when you said that earlier, I know because I've seen it in Normandy, I've seen uh, people with caps with Vietnam era vet with the, the understanding that they were in during that period, but they never left Nebraska, for example, which is no yeah. lesser service. You're still yes. serving. Yes. But we didn't ever make that separation with World War II. We, we, we treat them all in the same way, which is quite right. And, you know, mm -hmm. but we, we have kind of accepted 
in the years that followed that there are different ways of serving in the military mm-hmm. that are valid. But World War II has been idealized. Everybody is everybody is kind of bare chested and running across a beach with a machine gun and mm-hmm. shooting down enemy aircraft. And you know, it, mm-hmm. there's a massive great tale behind the behind the the U.S. and the, the Allied militaries in 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 by the middle part of the war that is fueling and funding and all and, and mm. logistics behind it. But we're going down a massive great rabbit hole. Yeah. I'm going to end things that people have said we could we could talk for an hour, but I want to end it so that people watch the show later because they will they like the shorter ones after. But um yeah. I'm now trying to think what excuse I can have for inviting you back again to, to do so because I'm thinking already a panel discussion with you part of it about America in 1942 and 43. John Parshall is, is is in my head as a potential mm. panelist and yourself and and just get to grips with this this historiography of, mm, of, yeah. of the view of the war and where we are and understanding the US. And But uh, anyway, we'll, we'll, but I urge people to go and buy the book. There are links in the description below or you can find it in your, at your favourite bookstore. And um, have you enjoyed talking to me and our, our happy bunch of viewers? Yes, this has been fantastic. I really enjoyed this. Brilliant. Well, we'll invite you back on the time. So, folks, uh, nothing tomorrow. I may or may I'm definitely back on Sunday talking about Omaha Beach with Michael Ackerman. And I may be back on Saturday with Ryan, but he's still got some issues he's dealing with. That's the, the, the Pacific show, but definitely back on Sunday and lots more stuff coming on that way next week. But from now, I'm going to say goodbye, everybody. This is Paul Widows for World War II TV saying enjoy the rest of your Thursday. And thank you to my guest, Brooke Blower. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.